welcome you to today's topic of filming the police while they are at work. Basically, today I want to do filming the police when you are having any type of interaction with them because this is what makes it important because this can either be used to exonerate them from doing any wrong or actually establish any wrongdoing that they're doing, which is probably why they don't like to be recorded. So today I'm gonna to go into a little bit deeper information on recording the police because I had spoke about the original context of recording the police comes from the Freedom of Information Act. It has a section in it that talks about photography. It talks about news media. It talks about freelance photography and video recording. And it is the Open Government Act of 2007. The reason why I want to go into that is because I hear a lot of people speaking about the DHS memo from 2010, the DHS memo from 2012. Now, here's why that's important because they are not training police officers on the DHS memo. So when you're saying that, it's a reason they're con you constantly have to take it with you and show it to them. They don't know what it is unless they actually look it up because they've heard somebody say or watch a video and it's on there. They're not trained on the DHS memo. Now, here's where the actual law comes into play. Fields v the city of Philadelphia, and it's a 2012 case. Now, here's why it's important. Now, when you're looking at someone going out and you're, let's say it's, it's just an ordinary traffic stop, you turn on your camera or your cell phone and you flip it out or whatever so you can actually film the encounter. The reason why you're able to do that because it's a First Amendment protected act. There are also First Amendment auditors that go into government buildings. The reason why they're able to do that is because of the Open Government Act of 2007, which was then reinforced by Turner v. Driver. Because what happened is there was a recognition because of the readily availability that was made by cell phones being taken in and out of government buildings and people were using them to record and then they were posting the video. Now, when you understand the aspect of why that became important in 2012 and 2013, that is when the actual training nationwide began. So when you talk about the 2010 DHS memo, that's why you're running into a lot of the extras that you're running into because you're talking about something that for the most part, they were not being trained on as of yet. So now we get to 2012 memo. They were just beginning to be recognized and beginning to be trained because we still run into a lot of officers that are not trained on the First Amendment at all. Fields v. City of Philadelphia established the right to record the police officers engaged in official duties in public. I apologize about that. Had to do a location change. Fields v. the City of Philadelphia actually established the right to record police officers performing their duties in public, which also, you know, kind of leads into Turner v. Driver, which allowed, again, reinforcement of the Open Government Act of 2007. It also reiterated going inside government facilities and recording in public or publicly accessible areas that have no restrictions, which is why many times you see when you go into courthouses now that they've moved the security door or the security checkpoint almost to the front door because once you go past security, it is no longer in most cases deemed a public area, which there are times which it is considered that way, but they can use the form of a restricted area simply because there are guards posted and you have to do something to gain access. When you also understand when you are recording police officers in public, you have to do so in a manner that does not obstruct 
their ability to perform their duty, which means you cannot be, you know, all over their shoulder. There are instances where you also want to worry about your safety, not officer safety. With them being uncomfortable is not a matter of law. It is pretty much a personal preference. There are cases that I'll go over where you have to be at least 10 feet in some cases, 20 feet. And if there's an armed suspect, you definitely want to be out of harm's way as much as possible, but you can still continue recording. And even when you're talking about people that do what they call cop watch, they have the right to record police officers conducting official activities in public. And that's the key phrase of it, in public or in public view. Because citizens recording of officers inherently fail within principles as photos, film, and audio footage allow viewers to see and hear more accurately the police activity they were entitled to witness and facilitate citizens' disclosure. So when you're looking at these things, you have to take into account the one thing I've mentioned on multiple occasions, and it's the fact that when you're dealing with instances of police shootings, you don't have a complete account. And 76% of all video comes from bystanders and not police officers, which bystander footage of officers fills the gaps in officer body camera and dashboard cameras, recording enriches journalistic reporting and spurs actions on all level of government to address police misconduct and protect civil rights. Because again, when we talk about the blue wall, it's not a myth. They've literally taken the American flag and placed a blue stripe in the middle of it. And that's because they are showing unity among themselves. And the issue I have with that is simple. The policing of themselves is what's being fall or what's being left out because they are not their brother's keepers. They re think that everything that happens inside stays inside and they do not correct the behavior of poor behaving police officers. Because even at the end of the day, when we're looking at maybe three or four police officers not doing the right thing, at the same time, we forget that they're in a precinct of three or four hundred. So while we're looking at the 1%, the 99 is not correcting them. And that's what most people are having issue with. And these are the ones that I'm speaking about when I say when they do not do the right thing, these are the ones that definitely need to be taken out of the force and sued in their personal capacity. And that's where it comes into a lot of times you hear them say, oh, I have qualified immunity. Now, here's the greatest aspect of that. Qualified immunity provides a defense to government actors unless they violate a right so clearly established that every reasonable official would have understood that he was doing violates that right. So what you have left, things that dispel qualified immunity, it is incompetency and willful acts. Incompetency, that they are incompetent, which means they are not able to fulfill their job, or they're doing something to violate that act willfully, such as enforcing a policy. I'm going to get into that a little bit because one of the things that you have to do when they're looking to enforce a policy, you also see a lot of First Amendment auditors do it as well. They ask for it in writing, or they're taking pictures of policy that's posted on a door outside of a, a courthouse or police station or what have you. And what happens is if they attempt to enforce policy over law, that is a willful act and they are now liable and they do not have qualified immunity because of the willful act. And the biggest stress about this is the fact that because of the readily availableness of cell phones with cameras on them now, police officers began to be trained and made known or aware of cameras and being recorded from 2000 
12, 2013. That is the establishment of the knowledge of public recording. Police should reasonably expect to be photographed, videotaped, and audibly recorded by the public, and it is made clear that officers should not obstruct or prevent this conduct. If they are doing so by standing in front of you, moving back and forth so you don't have a clear view, if they are doing anything that obstructs your ability to continue to videotape them performing their duty, it is a willful act and a violation which drops their qualified immunity. And the place that I got the, the information regarding the qualified immunity loss is a case that I'm gonna I'm actually gonna have to leave this one up there for a few extra seconds because I'm going to mispronounce it more than likely. Messer Schmidt v. Mendler. 565 US 535 546 2012. All but the plainly incompetent or those who knowingly violate the law are protected by qualified immunity. If they are not incompetent and they don't willfully act to violate your rights, they are protected by qualified immunity. If they are incompetent, they lose qualified immunity. If they do perform a willful act to violate your rights, they lose qualified immunity. And the greatest part about this entire thing is the courts are instructed to disregard and ignore department policy when it's taken account to what the actual law is. And if you remember, I think it was maybe the third or fourth video I did, and I spoke about Policy never has the weight of law, no matter how well accepted or how often used. Law trumps policy. And now that we have that, keep that in mind. So when you're going forward, understand when you're out taking video, you are freelance. You are media. And when you're sitting down and you're going into these places, you're not talking about the DHS memo. You're talking about the Freedom of Information Act. You're talking about the Open Government Act of 2007, which allows your activity that went into actual force in 2012, 2013, because of fields v. the city of Philadelphia. So keep that in mind. Go out there, keep being safe, and when you have any encounter, it becomes either support or it becomes evidence. So... Until next time.